Hi guys and welcome back to another Turbo Dose. We've got me and Matt here and we're going to talk about the unconscious patient and the, the approach to the unconscious patient. So essentially we're just going to run through sort of A to E assessment hopefully to sort of better prepare you for some of the scenarios that you're going to either come into or virtually undertake as part of the approach to the unconscious patient. <laughs> I guess you're sort of much more qualified in dealing with these patients than than I am at the moment. Hopefully, not too many of my patients uh, in primary care are, uh, are unconscious. What, <laughs> what, what what's your initial approach to the unconscious patient? Well, I mean, as as ever, it's it's the A to E shock horror A to D approach. I yeah, know. Wow. The thing, you know, with with airway, often airway is sort of something you you know you semi skip. Most of us scenarios, patients are alert and talking. Um, and actually with with unconscious patients you need to be aware that their airway is going to be at risk so we often quote a gcs of less than h you need to intubate uh, and that's that's largely true i think the, the thought process there certainly is is relevant and it's about if you've got a low gcs those patients will start to lose their airway reflexes and um, so you may need to complete some maneuvers working up through your nasopharyngeal or pharyngeal airways obviously always escalating for help if there is any evidence of a of an obstructed or partially obstructed airway. So would you say then sort of that airway when we're doing these sort of scenarios um, and, and training for this, if you if you're noticing that there is an unconscious patient, so it's you know technically definitely going to be a GCS of less than eight, that they'd be escalating sort of immediately from that perspective. Absolutely, I think it's entirely appropriate. And when we when we have sort of new junior doctors um, in the department, and when we do sort of trust wide induction, if someone's got a low GCS. And certainly if they've got any airway um, compromise, then we always advise putting out a crash call. And when they come into the department, if we say we tell them if they've got a patient who's got a low GCS or airway compromise, they press the, the crash bell. And then that means you get, you know, everyone and their dog turns up. You get senior people there early. Uh, and I think I'd definitely advocate that for our sims. And if you've got a patient with a low GCS, great, you know, do do a head tilt chin lift, do a jaw thrust, put a nasopharyngeal in, you know, size up an oral, uh, oral pharyngeal put an eye gel in if you're, if you're trained to do so and the patient would tolerate it but you need or someone needs to be escalating to either anesthetics or via a crash team to get those senior people there early. Do we move on to breathing and, and thinking about the unconscious patient the way in which I'm thinking about this the first thing I want to know is what is the rate of this uh, patients breathing because actually if they're sort of hypoventilating if they're bradypneic I'm going to want to start thinking about ventilating that patient and that's the first thing I want to know it's just like in circulation you know is there a pulse or not because actually the treatment strategy is very very different is the patient breathing uh, is it low or is it high if, if you've got a bradypneic patient you may see that in your sort of agonal um, agonal breathing some some other terminal stages of shock and things like that but quite often in things like opioid toxicity as well which is a you know a very common presentation looking at their um, breathing rate is important but also looking at that sort of breathing pattern so you know is this is, is this chain stokes breathing so agonal breathing as, as i mentioned is it sort of cut that sort of exaggerated sighing cusmal breathing as in diabetic ketoacidosis and, and are, are they having any apneic episodes you know, i always remember a patient that i had who was profoundly hyponatremic and was having um apneic episodes and mm -hmm. actually any, any, anything that was found on on, on investigation afterwards was just a, a, a really significant hyponatremia i think in scenarios particularly and and also potentially in you know in practice something that we see quite significantly is yeah we know what to do when the breathing rate is low but what happens when there's a tachypnea you know what do we do because there's not a drug to slow down the breathing specifically but there's a drug to manage the underlying cause of that tachypnea and so actually we always advocate don't we you know if there's a tachypnea patient that's time to investigate at B isn't it make sure that the patient's stripped down to their chest do an, a proper IPPA assessment um, and actually start looking for those underlying causes are they shocked are they septic is this traumatic is it a sort of um, pneumothorax or something like that so so breathing is really important in the unconscious patient Uh, moving on to, to C then, so circulation. From the unconscious patient point of view, we're particularly interested in shock. So if, if somebody's got a low responsive level, when we're talking about shock, we're not talking about a mild hypotension. These are highly shocked patients. So we're thinking about, is this anaphylaxis? Is this 
you know, a large stem is it something, are they bleeding out? Is it an aortic uh, issue, a dissection or, or an aneurysm that's popped? Is it a consequence of major trauma, possibly, if they're, again, if they're bleeding out from somewhere? So these patients are going to be highly peripherally shut down, they're going to be very hypotensive. They should be tachycardic as well as their body attempts to to respond to that low blood pressure. When you see patients who are horrendously shocked, the paleness of these patients, I, I saw one actually at the weekend, a lady had a very large um, ST elevation MI. Her colour was horrible. It was a grey, purple, highly clammy colour. It's, it's very striking and it's a very significant indicator of how unwell they are. And then obviously we're going to be considering sort of fluid boluses, plus minus you know, blood products if they're, if they're bleeding. And again, it's about that escalation of care. And then moving on to, to disability is obviously they're going to be the crux of what we're interested in. And we're going to start with either an AVPU or a GCS. Now, I'm, I, I've mentioned before, I'm not a big fan of AVPU. AVPU is great if you're in sort of like an ALS type scenario where you've got someone who's peri arrest and you just want to make sure, are they alert? Are they talking, responding to voice? Are they responding to pain? But actually, when you've got the time, you want to do a proper GCS. And the key marker of GCS is, is the motor score. So motor scores of four or above are suggestive of essentially some salvageability of something from the brain. So if, if somebody's having an intracranial hemorrhage, the neurosurgeons are interested most in the motor score of the GCS, uh, with that motor score of four being prognostically important. Don't do your patients a disservice by doing a, a, a duff GCS. When they've got a low conscious level, make sure you're doing a proper and sustained pain stimulus just to generally you know, really work out what that motor score is. It's often difficult to differentiate between abnormal flexion, flexion and localising to pain, which obviously be three, four and five. And if you end up doing a, a NAF pain stimulus and end up saying that patient has a motor score of three, then the neurosurgical input is going to be very different to if you do a really good pain stimulus. And actually you can go, yeah, they're actually they're localising to pain. I'm, I'm confident they're localising to pain, giving them a motor score of five. That's obviously going to change the neurosurgical plan and obviously the outcome for your patient. So, yeah, I think that's I think that's really important, Matt. And, and, and it's about that sort of moving past the concern for harming your patient, because actually what's going to harm your patient is is not getting that score, isn't it? And not being able mm. to escalate because you've got an inaccurate reduced GCS. Obviously, thinking about GCS, you know, if, if, if it's less than eight, which is you know significant and, and you're going into that comatose state, then, then that is associated with your your intubation criteria and your airway problems. So it's really important to reassess airway once you get down to a GCS and you realise that it's that it's quite low. I think at disability as well, apart from doing your you want you want to start thinking about doing that sort of secondary survey, don't you? you want to start thinking about what's happening here? And for that, you want to look at head injuries. You want to look at um, any trauma that you may have missed you want to uh, check for pupils so there's, a, there's, there's multiple different findings um, sort of in pupils but specifically you want to look for pinpoint pupils as a sign of an opioid overdose bilateral dilated pupils you can see in a lot lot of different medications and drugs uh, then looking for later signs of head trauma so if you've got a unilaterally dilated or what they call blown pupil and that's kind of a late sign of, of her brain herniation essentially so you're so you're not doing well and you're, you've got significantly raised ICP so all of these things can be um, really beneficial I think checking the pupils in in sort of conscious patients sort of loses its valor a little bit doesn't it because actually we do this in head injuries quite often but the reality is, is that you know if they're up and alert and speaking to you they're probably not going to have a blown pupil they're probably not pre-coning but definitely in an unconscious patient it's a really uh, effective uh, investigation to do and um, it's one of your bugbears isn't it checking pupils in <laughs> in conscious patients and, and you're absolutely right because if we, we get it quite a few times you get like, oh so they've got unequal pupils and someone's just got a, a pupil of like four or five one side and then three the other side yeah and they're like oh it could be a blown pupil and like well actually they're gcs 15 so they're not coning yeah yeah, you know, it's a very late sign. It's a normal variant in a lot of individuals, actually, to have slight, slightly unequal pupils. So I think it's just important to 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 understand why you're doing investigations and when you do them. So Matt, you you quite often talk about sort of blood sugar in 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 unconsciousness. Why, why is that important? I asked uh, sarcastically. Yeah, it's something I go on about. It's because I missed one once when I was a, an F1. It was a patient with a low GCS, and I just didn't check a sugar. Mm. Um, and I've I've seen patients arrest because of because of hypoglycemia before. And actually, it's a very easily picked up, easily reversible cause of someone with a low GCS. If you're not going to do a blood gas on an unconscious patient, you, I mean, you have to have a good reason not to do a blood gas, in my opinion. But if you're not going to do a blood gas, you need to make sure that you're doing a, a blood sugar, so a finger prick uh, blood sugar. It's, it's very quick, takes what, 30 seconds or so maximum. 
um, and it's like easily easily reversible, but also very easily missed. So, so that's the sort of main principles for running through uh, HOE assessment on, on unconscious patients. It's good to keep your differential broad um, and, and just working through the, the sort of HOE and thinking about causes of unconsciousness in each of those stages and the risk of being unconsciousness, such as airway, as we keep alluding to. So sort of thinking about to finish off with the most common causes of low GCS. So we've already talked about hypoglycemia. We've talked about overdose. Matt, what are the, some of the other ones that you sort of think of in, in terms of um, unconscious states? It's that raised ICP. Uh, and for, for me, the most common causes I see that are, are stroke, so intracerebral uh, hemorrhages um, and, head, and head injuries. So if they're having some sort of bleed into the brain, it's going to be rising their intracranial pressure. Another big one is seizures. So whether you know, during the actual seizure itself, when they're going to be you know, unresponsive GCS3 and also the post ictal phase where their GCS can be anything from well, sort of three to 14, 15, really. Remember, not all seizures are witnessed. So if you've got if you've got somebody with a very high lactate with a low GCS, just consider have they had a seizure. Um, we see it quite a lot in the elderly and in young people. And again, it's, it's the cause of the seizure. So do they have epilepsy? Are they known to have something that's going to make them seize? Or have they taken something that, that could cause seizures? So, again, we're thinking about sort of street drugs and things oh, back to our overdoses. Or is there a, an organic brain pathology if, you're, if you've got an elderly patient? So do they have a, an undiagnosed brain tumour? Or, again, have they had a, an intracranial hemorrhage that's caused them to seize? Yeah, and I think to just finish off with, you know, we, we always like to bang the sepsis <coughs> drum, don't we? There, there, are, there are patients that, that, that will be caught sort of late on, um, particularly those sort of vulnerable patients, and they, they may be sort of in an unconscious state from, a, from a, um, uh, an infection of some sort. And then, and then metabolic disorders, really. So thinking about your diabetic, so DKA, HHS, HHS thinking about adrenal issues, um, thinking about thyroid issues, not, not, not incredibly common, but sort of doing bloods and, and, and thinking about that. I think uh, DKA being one of the more important ones to, to think about. If, you've, if you're sort of running through that list and, and you've got that in your mind, then that's a really good broad differential for you to kind of work down through um, whilst you're doing your A to E. Mm-hmm.